Oh, since we were last on the air, Dana White was asked about George St. Pierre and his mm-hmm. seeming willingness or desire to fight Khabib Nurmagomedov. And he, George, clearly sees the upside, Kenny, of that fight. But Dana White came out and said that if he is going to try to drop down to 155 pounds, he would first have to take on one of these contender types. Now, the UFC did right George St. Pierre when he came out of retirement four years out of the game. They gave an immediate UFC middleweight title shot to him against Michael Bisping, which he took advantage of, obviously. But this time around, I think you got to understand where Dana's coming from. To inject George into this division that is top-heavy and absolutely loaded and have him pass by all of these contenders, I understand the money play would be to make GSP Khabib, but I kind of like the UFC taking a stance here and saying, look, we appreciate your body of work, but we got Tony Ferguson, a lot of guys waiting in the wings that are, at least on paper, more worthy of that championship opportunity. Oh, sure. But, uh, you know, in, in this game, you don't pick what's most worthy, you know, who is most worthy, right? Um, first of most all, most of the I, time, you're right. I, you, you know what I'm saying? It, it's about it's, it's the money game. Uh, so the fact that they're going this route, I think, is a great thing. Tony Ferguson absolutely deserves this shot. No doubt about it. Is that why they're doing that? Probably not. Um, you know, I, I listen, I, I think a, a fight between George St. Pierre and Habib Nurmagomedov is, would, would be a huge fight, would be a massive fight. Um, I'd say this, you know, Habib should fight Tony Ferguson. Let's see if they could get it done for a fourth time. Would be the fourth time or the fifth time? I think the fifth. Bro. Jesus. All right. Well, <laughs> yeah, fifth time. Let, let's see. Let's see if five, the fifth time is the charm and uh, make that fight happen. Um, if Habib is able to get by Tony Ferguson, uh, no, no easy task. <clears throat> then you make a you make a super fight, you know, because obviously here's the big problem, right? The UFC knows that George St. Pierre most likely isn't going to defend that title. He's going to fight right. once and go home. So, uh, which I get to, you know, he, he's deserving of a super fight. Um, the guy has done it all. This would be his third world championship, um, which would be just unbelievable uh but you you do it at, at a, maybe 160 pounds or 165 you know whatever habib uh, right. agrees to i know habib isn't a big fan of cutting down to 155 consistently like that uh do a super fight and then uh you know one of those guys or both of those guys right off into the sunset so how do you feel about gsp potentially cutting down to 155 pounds right. or is your thesis statement just far be it from me to doubt this guy when it comes to putting his mind to something and accomplishing that task right well listen i think he's a guy first of all that is mentally strong enough to make that weight mm-hmm. um i don't know how he would fight at that weight that that's a that's a whole thing right. uh, that's a right. whole different animal um I, I made 145 uh but really did not bring everything i, I had on, on fight night i was just too sapped um, I don't know what George would be able to bring on fight night. Uh, would he make the weight? I absolutely believe he would. Uh, right. Would he still be a, a tough challenge for Habib? Absolutely. Would it be the same George St. Pierre that we're used to seeing? I don't know. Um, 155 is a big cut. I do know he's walking around much lighter than he used to. Supposedly uh, mid-180s, uh, which a lot of 155ers walk around at. Not a lot, but a, right. a lot of the larger ones, right? Uh, you look at... Yep. Um, you know, uh, trying to think, Habib Nurmagomedov Felder. himself, uh, Gray Maynard, Paul Felder, uh, Kevin Lee. Uh, these guys are huge lightweights that walk around, eh, you know, high 180s, maybe 190s. Yeah, I, he's uh, to, <laughs> maybe 190s. I mean, Paul yeah. Felder has intimated publicly that he has walked around uh, north of 190. Right, that's insane. So, so I think he's totally capable of doing that, but I think something that would make a little bit more sense would be, you know, a super fight in the 160s. So, yeah. yeah. I wonder if George St. Pierre would come back if there wasn't a championship scenario. It would seem to me like there – yeah, I mean, maybe a super fight at a mm-hmm. catchweight against a guy who is 27-0 and the most dominant force in the game at present would have the appeal that would bring him back. But I think if there's not a belt on the line, I'm not sure that George would be willing or want to put in all the work that comes before it. But an interesting talking point nonetheless. And yeah. I think for me, my biggest takeaway is that Dana White is wanting to make Tony and Habib again. And I think that is very exciting because that is the dream matchup, I think, for 90% of the avid mixed martial arts fans. And even though, I mean, the odds are in favor, Kenny, of that fight staying together, right? It's gone away (laughs) four times. 
I mean, I don't want to say to yourself, oh, fifth uh, time's going to be the charm, but the odds are so in favor of those guys making it to fight night because four times one or the other hasn't been able to do so. Okay, fine. I- I'll go with that. I'll get on that train. But can yes. we all yes. just agree, everyone just kind of shake hands and say, if it doesn't happen for a fifth time, can we just can we just not yeah. have these guys fight ever? It's just not going to happen. Okay? It's not right. going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's where Dana was after the fourth matchup went away. Right. right? He was like, oh, I can't uh. put this fight. I can't. I can't issue bout agreements for this fight because one of these guys is not going to make it to fight night. Yes. But, oh, man. Or they have it, it, handlers it, with, like, gloves and, like, cotton balls that follow them yeah. around wherever they go and just, like, yeah. make sure no one hurts them. Well, man. and I also think, too, is that you make the paydays large enough that even if you got a torn ACL, you find your way to make that walk to the octagon. <laughs> I mean, we know a lot of guys who walk in there 60 65%. This is true. Certainly true. we want a, a full-throttle Tony Ferguson and a full-throttle Khabib Nurmagomedov, yeah. but interesting nonetheless, and, and I do think that's going to be the next fight and the next It's an amazing fight. Khabib. So a couple changes to UFC 230 since we were last on the air, and we've got some stuff on, on Derek Lewis and Daniel Cormier, time permitting, later in the show, but Luke Rockhold pulling out of this co-main event slot against Chris Weidman. They move Jacques de Souza out of his fight against David Branch, to fight Chris Weidman. And you can say that this isn't necessarily a prime Jacques de Souza, but this is a new matchup at 185 pounds. It's a matchup that you and I have talked to mm-hmm. Ray Longo at length about. And as we in one breath wish Luke Rockhold the best in a speedy recovery, in another breath we say this is a fresh matchup and one at middleweight that I've been dying to see for years. That's your new co-main event come November 3rd at MSG. It's an amazing fight, and I think Chris Weidman uh, and Ray Longo has wanted that fight for a long time because of the way that Chris matches up against Jacare. Jacare is most dangerous when he gets on top. He has excellent takedowns. Does he have takedowns uh, to become a threat towards a guy like Chris Weidman? I don't know. Now, he found some success. I think he was able to put uh, Gastelum on his back briefly. Um... But as the fight wore on, it was Gaslam's wrestling that allowed him to keep that fight on the feet. Um, I assume that Weidman wants to do the same thing, use his wrestling to stop those takedowns. If he gets on top, I don't think Chris is going to be afraid uh, to get on top of Jacare. I think especially a little bit later, second, third rounds, uh, fourth rounds, you know, to be a threat towards Jacare. I still think he, he could be a threat with his ground and pound. Jacare has a, has a dangerous guard, but it's never been the part of his game that is scariest uh, when it comes to his jiu-jitsu game. So, um, you know, I, I think that's an interesting fight. I think Chris matches up very well against him. Uh, both those guys do have knockout power. Jacare Souza, especially with that overhand. Uh, so it's that's a great fight. That's a great replacement. I feel sorry for David Branch. Does David have a replacement? I'm not sure I heard that. He does. He so does. Okay, it is, who is it? It is Jared Cannonier making his oh, UFC okay. middleweight step debut. In. That's right. So okay. and he had a fight later in November, so he mm-hmm. just sort of abbreviated the training camp and, and hopefully he'll land on 186 pounds come November second. But yeah, so it'll be Cannoneer Branch on the main card on pay per view and the new co main event is Jacare Souza and Chris Weidman. And of course one man who has a lot to say about that, Ray Longo, let us get to him. It's now time for the Ray Longo Minute. I want you to punch a hole in this fucking chest. That's what I want. The Ray Longo Minute. John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. So as we bring in the great Ray Longo with his drop that says put a hole in his fucking chest. I don't know if you saw Mark Goddard on Twitter this weekend, Ray, going back and forth with fans. I didn't know until Goddard's tweets that corner men are not allowed to cuss and fighters are not allowed to swear that it's like a violation. Is Did, did you know that was in the rules? Um, obviously, I never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I don't, it's called I don't the Longo I, Clause. I don't even know something. if I could go through a fight without cursing, but I would, I would try rules. But no, I never knew that at all. I'm gonna try and to pull know, up the like, tweet as I'm, we're talking, yeah, so I that can. Rule some, bullshit, that, I, oh, that rule is bullshit, Ray. That rule is 100 percent bullshit. I mean, you get you, know, you get emotional and things happen, and part of it so, is to lose your diction and your language uh, skills. Yes, but uh, man, a lot could happen in a week, though, John. Yeah, oh no, and I know, but I just so it says a fighter slash corner cannot shout out across the octagon obscenities in a fight. A fighter can talk to his opponent so long as it's not bellowed openly. Um, 
But uh, I guess I'll have to go back and, and look up the rules. Ray, do we still have you, sir? I mean, I, I can hear you. Okay, we can hear you. We can't see you, but th- you know what? That's okay. I, I see enough of you, I think, on a week-to-week yeah. basis that I'm okay with <laughs> you, just audio. You, so you know what's horrible, get... John? I can see myself, which is <laughs> That's a beautiful thing. So before we get into this whole Chris Weidman situation, and I know you've got a lot to say about that, it looked, for, it looked like maybe one and one for you on the regional scene this weekend. Is that right? Uh, no, regionals, uh, we had a couple of losses, uh, but the, the two main guys, yeah, we had one big win, Charlie Campbell, a right. uh, great fight, and uh, we had uh, Justin Montalvo, who was a big surprise to me, Got actually got knocked out, and I, I've never even seen him buckled in the gym, so anything can happen with the little gloves, but I expect him to come back. He's a great sparring partner for everybody, and he's a big asset to the gym, but yeah, to both guys, uh yeah, and then we had a couple other people, uh, you know, win a belt and a couple other losses. So we, we had six guys fighting. It was a crazy night, Friday night. 